From the Caribbean islands to the east coast of the United States, a deadly drug gang makes millions. But its leader remains a mystery. As their cocaine trafficking business thrives, the violence rages out of control. To destroy the gang, agents and police know they must identify the leader and take him down. States is one of the most profitable drug markets in the world. For ruthless and sophisticated drug traffickers, it is truly the land of opportunity. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. In the 1990s, a violent drug organization moved thousands of kilos of Colombian cocaine through the Virgin Islands and into Georgia. It would take a task force of dedicated agents and police to shut down this multi-million dollar operation and destroy a cocaine empire. The U.S. Virgin Islands are a tourist's paradise. Lush tropical islands and miles of sandy beaches, all in America's backyard. But these islands hold a dark secret. Law enforcement refers to them as the cocaine funnel. Because they are located halfway between South America and the U.S. mainland, drug gangs use the islands to ship large amounts of cocaine into the U.S. Starting in the early 90s, a drug gang called the Island Boys shipped thousands of kilos of cocaine into the U.S. through the Virgin Islands. They chose the unlikely city of Augusta, Georgia as their main point of entry. There they turned the cocaine into crack. <laughs> FBI Special Agent Tim Cox. It was, um primarily the population that drew them in. At the time, there were several projects that were, were ripe for selling crack cocaine. Um, it's also a, a two-hour city. You're, you're two hours away from Atlanta. You're two hours away from Savannah. But the competition between the island boys and local drug gangs is brutal. Eugene Smalls runs the Augusta operation for the island boys business is good. In 1991, the gang is raking in millions. And Smalls makes a big target. There are rumors he keeps a million dollars in cash in his safety deposit box. He wears the key around his neck. Augusta police arrive, Eugene Small's safety deposit box is empty, and the powerful drug dealer is fighting for his life. He survives, but his injuries are severe. The rising violence in Augusta concerns police, and the island boys are at the center of it. The Augusta police discuss the problem with the FBI. They start by explaining what they know about the gang. The Local authorities, through their contacts with informants and some of the arrests that they'd made previously, knew that there was an increasing number of these gentlemen coming up from the Virgin Islands. The informants have given indication that they were moving more and more cocaine into the area. In October 1992, the FBI and U.S. Customs worked to build a federal conspiracy case against the Island Boys. Cox suspects the Island Boys are working with a major Colombian cocaine cartel. One thing is clear, they are as mysterious as they are deadly. We didn't have any inroads into the group, so 
and we're having to put together as much intel as we could by bits and pieces. Agents assemble photos of suspected gang members taken by the local drug squad. Former U.S. Customs agent Larry Sapp. So no, not even, we didn't even know who they were. We'd put them in there to see if someone would later identify them. They also scour every report they can find that has any connection to the Island Boys. One report stands out. A month earlier, two DEA agents spotted Eugene Smalls at the airport in Atlanta. Despite his injuries, the local drug boss personally picked up a passenger on a flight from the Virgin Islands. The DEA decided to follow Smalls. Agents radioed the Georgia Highway Patrol and asked them to pull the car over for speeding. A DEA had had enough of the, uh, following them and, and joined the locals there and got them, they got them all out of the car, searched them, took all their money, tried to interview them all. Smalls could barely walk. His passenger, James Springett, was carrying a passport from the U.S. Virgin Islands. Agents also searched the car. They found nothing, no drugs, no weapons, and surprisingly little cash. The DEA photographed the two men as well as their credit cards and IDs and had to let them go. Agents can use the credit card information to track the movements of all four suspects. But there's also a downside. Then they know that they've been watched, or are being watched, and may affect their behavior in the future. They may be more careful of uh, surveillances and, and more careful of movements and, and things of this nature. Agents wonder about James Springett. Who is he, and what role does he play? Eugene Smalls picked him up at the airport personally, even though Smalls was still recovering from bullet wounds. Obviously, James Springett is important. Special Agent Cox contacts the local police to see if they have any information. The Richmond County Sheriff's Department Narcotics Squad have been fighting the gang since it first arrived in Augusta. But they have never heard of James Springett. If law enforcement hopes to take down the Island Boys, they're going to have to do it the hard way, from the bottom up. We started on the street level, doing surveillances when we could, getting information from the local authorities, and trying to develop some other inroads into the group. Again, they hit a brick wall. The Island Boys have a dangerous reputation. Even paid informants were afraid to talk about the group. It was hard to develop informants because this group was known to be violent and informants were afraid to do anything with them because they had a reputation for hurting and killing people. Federal authorities conduct surveillance. They observe that members of the gang frequently use motel rooms to do business. After they check out, teams of agents search their rooms. You'd be surprised that you find phone numbers, uh, photos, different things. This whole case was like somebody that had filled a room with puzzle pieces and we're trying to dig our way out and figure out who is who. The pressure is constant and intense. Too intense for Eugene Smalls, the head of the Augusta Island Boys. We were putting a lot of heat on him. Eugene Smalls decides to relocate to Virginia. I personally think that the reason Eugene left was things were getting too hot for them around Augusta. In Smalls' absence, a man named Shaquem Gabriel becomes the new leader of the Island Boys operation in Augusta, Georgia. Agent Sapp alerts Virginia authorities. Eugene Smalls is heading their way. They were on him as soon as he got up there and worked him and found a good case up there. Smalls is arrested in Virginia Beach for drug trafficking and eventually convicted and sentenced to 90 years in prison. In Augusta, agents focus on Shaquem Gabriel, the new leader of the Island Boys. They suspect the gang is bringing drugs in through the Atlanta airport. 
when you look at the amount of money that they were running, plus the amount of cocaine that we knew they were putting on the street, it was obvious they were having to, to run lots of loads of luggage through or, and use lots of couriers. On June 14, 1995, agents in Atlanta find a suitcase containing seven kilos, more than 15 pounds of cocaine. James, we can change this around. Who are you delivering the coke to? Investigators question the courier. He tells agents the drugs were going to Shaquem Gabriel in Augusta. We had enough cooperating information, you know, through uh, phone tolls and that is to substantiate exactly what the uh, uh, courier was saying. <laughs> Based on the courier's statement, authorities are able to obtain an arrest warrant and a warrant to search Gabriel's home. On June 15th, 1995, authorities serve both warrants. As the agents close in, they have no idea what Gabriel has waiting for them behind his door. In Augusta, Georgia, the FBI, along with US Customs and local police, work to take down a violent drug gang. Investigators arrest Shaquem Gabriel, the man they believe is the new head of the Island Boys in Augusta. Gabriel is accused of attempting to receive seven kilos of cocaine from a courier from the Virgin Islands. A search of his home turns up documents, photos, and $15,000 in ones. Special Agent Tim Cox. Apparently, Shaquem felt it was beneath him to spend dollar bills, so he wouldn't spend dollar bills, he would stuff them in these jars. For law enforcement, Gabriel's arrest is a big success, but it doesn't stop the Island Boys. As soon as authorities take Gabriel into custody, agents suspect that new leaders are already emerging to take over the gang. Whenever we'd take people off from the group, make an arrest or anything else, other people from the islands would arrive back in the States and take their place in the group distributing around Augusta area. Investigators continue to go after the Island Boys using the same techniques they used to take down Gabriel. But it's not working. It seems the Island Boys have changed tactics. They must be using another means of getting their drugs past customs at the airport. Agents have to find it. Customs expands its searches, both in the Virgin Islands and in U.S. airports. On February 6, 1996, agents get a break when a random customs check finds cocaine in a suitcase arriving in Atlanta. The bag belongs to a teenage girl from a housing project in Augusta. The gang has been eluding police by using couriers that don't fit the usual profile. Former U.S. Customs agent Larry Sapp they would uh, find young girls that had no money, no uh, future, and ask them would they like to go to the Virgin Islands for a week, free vacation. And of course, anyone would say yes, and the only stipulation was you had to bring back a package for them. These were easily influenced young people that just saw an opportunity to, to make some money. Granted, it was illegal, but in a sense, they were victims of this group as well. They couldn't bring a lot to the table for us, but what they could tell us is who offered the deal, what the deal was. The courier tells investigators she was hired by the girlfriend of Brian Gustav. Shortly after Gabriel's arrest, Gustav and his girlfriend arrived from the Virgin Islands. They've been running the Augusta Island Boys. The girl also gives them the names of other women who have worked as couriers. It takes more than a year to gather all the evidence against the new local leaders, but investigators have enough to arrest Gustav and his girlfriend. Brian Gustav is convicted of drug trafficking. His girlfriend takes a plea deal. Agents have taken out the leadership of the Island Boys in Augusta once again. When you do take them down and the next week, the same group is up and operating again, uh, it gets a little frustrating, but that's why we work 
to go up and get to the head of the organization because that's eventually the only way you're going to be able to stop them. Arresting drug dealers in Augusta is not stopping the flow of drugs into the U.S. Agents know they must find out who is running the Island Boys operation. Their leader must be in the Virgin Islands. In 1996, the U.S. Virgin Islands became designated a HIDA, which stands for High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area. Detective Chris Howell is on the DEA task force formed to target drug traffickers in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Two minutes out. And up until this time frame, there hadn't been a lot of um, targeting of these people with established routes and cocaine trafficking. So the traffickers, by this, this point in the game, had become pretty powerful, and, and they had a lot at their disposal. So we had a lot of catching up to do. Agents begin questioning informants and learn that in St. Croix, a prominent local family is involved in the cocaine shipments from Colombia. Intelligence information that was gained from confidential sources stated that one of the family members was the St. Croix girlfriend of James Springett. Investigators recognized the name. In 1992, DEA agents photographed Springett after Eugene Smalls picked him up at the Atlanta airport. And that informant also told us that he was the biggest drug trafficker in the islands. And so our focus kind of started to begin to switch focus from this prominent family over to James Springett. Investigators discover that Springett's girlfriend has more than half a dozen cell phones in her name. These phones may hold the key to cracking this dangerous drug gang. When we began to look at those phones and look at the um, toll information off those phones, other names that came up through informant information began to appear on those tolls. And it was obvious that this, this girl had you know, something to do with what was going on. While agents pursue the cell phone lead, they continue to work the streets. From informants, agents learn that a small shipment of cocaine is scheduled to leave St. Thomas via seaplane. The surveillance team spots a suspected courier carrying a cardboard box aboard. The seaplane takes off for the largest of the U.S. Virgin Islands, St. Croix. We let them board the plane. We get airborne on their way back to St. Croix when we established surveillance where they were going to dock here in St. Croix. When the seaplane lands, Detective Chris Howell and the DEA are waiting. They suspect the box the courier is carrying is full of cocaine. Agents are in place for a routine takedown, but the plan changes. Something has spooked the courier. Agents must move in. The individual who was carrying the box ran straight to the ocean, jumped off the dock into the ocean. As he tore into the box, kilograms of cocaine began to float out into the water. The courier is trying to destroy the evidence. He knew that if he could get those packages open, once that cocaine hit the water, it would just dissolve and end to nothing. But I wasn't going to take any chance. I wanted to get all seven kilograms. I didn't want him to tear into anything. Detective Howell rescues several kilos of evidence and a cell phone purchased by Springett's girlfriend. The courier is in serious trouble, and he knows it. Still, he refuses to tell authorities who he's working for. In the islands, it's very rare to see people cooperate, very rare. When we arrest somebody, even when they're facing serious jail time, they'll just do their time, and that's it. As a result of the operation, the island boys are now on high alert. They know the feds are watching them. They quickly changed their tactics. Springett made an executive decision that they wouldn't bring cocaine directly into the U.S. Virgin Islands. Instead, the gang will use the island of Tortola to warehouse their drug shipments. The British Virgin Islands is literally uh, a five or 10 minute boat ride away from St. Thomas. So you could be in British waters and a minute later and you're in U.S. waters or, or international waters for that matter. 
as a British possession, Tortola is outside the jurisdiction of U.S. law enforcement. On June 19, 1996, the island boys bring 1.5 tons of cocaine on shore in Tortola. You're talking about loads that are worth millions and millions of dollars at a time. And very rarely does a group run that much dope without having some firepower behind them. Heavily armed Colombians are present to verify the delivery. Those people's job was not only to look after the South American interest, but also to protect the load. Cocaine is loaded into two vehicles, a truck and a van. This shipment is so important that James Springett personally oversees the transfer. The two vehicles head for a safe house to store the cocaine. The drug dealers are unaware the Royal Virgin Island Police are waiting for them. Officers have been watching the van for over a month. Every two weeks, it travels from the east end of the island to the west end, weighted down with something heavy. They suspected it could be drug trafficking, but they also suspected it might have been involved in some burglaries that had been occurring on the east end of the island. When a pickup and van approach, the Royal Virgin Island Police move in. The pickup manages to squeeze through the roadblock, but the van is stopped in its tracks. Suspects open fire with automatic weapons. The police are outgunned. Most of them had uh, six-shot revolvers, uh, shotguns with three rounds, and weaponry of this nature. And they stood up and returned fire against uh, automatic M16s, uh, firing a full burst. One officer is hit. And the round passed out the side of his head, and he was lying in a pool of blood on the street. And so they basically, at that point, um, began to try to keep him alive. The van gets away. The wounded officer is rushed to a hospital. Just wonder if just the shock, the impact didn't, alone didn't kill him. But it put his eye out and they got him to a hospital, he lost his eye, but uh, he uh, did live. The next day, police find the van a mile down the road. The tires, the radiator, and the engine have been shot to pieces. In the back of the van, police find 1,260 kilograms of cocaine. They also find night vision goggles, GPS devices, and lights for signaling aircraft. The Royal Virgin Island Police believe the drug runners will try to escape to a nearby island. They contact police commissioners in the U.S. Virgin Islands and the surrounding area asking for help. Authorities know they must locate these dangerous men fast. If they're willing to shoot a cop, no one is safe. In the British Virgin Islands, a firefight erupts between heavily armed drug runners and the royal police. The drug runners make a daring escape, but investigators seize a van full of cocaine. The royal police warn their counterparts on the surrounding islands to be on the lookout. It was almost like a Caribbean all-points bulletin. Detective Chris Howell. They put it out to all the police officers that this occurred and, you know, to be a lookout on the beaches and, and so forth, marinas, um, docks, you know, boat yards and everything, that these individuals may be heading our way. You've seen these guys right Police around the islands are on the alert for anything unusual. Early the next morning, officers stop a suspicious boat. There are no drugs or weapons aboard, but there is a large amount of cash. They were questioned and then later released by police as there wasn't enough evidence at the time to hold them. Those individuals were linked through informant information as being Springett's boat crew. They were the same boat crew that brought in the cocaine that had been recovered by police in Tortola. A few days later, U.S. Virgin Island police find the body of one of the men from the boat. He's been shot in the head twice, execution style. 
to me, that all that was was an indication that Spring S organization was not going to accept failure. There had to be a cost to losing that load, even if that meant the life of one of his own. At the roadblock, the gunman may have escaped, but the cocaine they lost was worth millions. You don't lose 1,260 kilograms of cocaine without someone paying for it. Springett had to go back to South America and explain this to the people he was getting cocaine from. And he didn't want to go back without there being a body attached to the loss. For Springett, it's a temporary setback. Kilograms of cocaine were, during this time frame, were almost on every commercial flight heading into the US mainland. They had dirty baggage handlers that would put cocaine um, in bags, sneak them past customs, put them on the aircraft, and then a mule would actually take custody of that bag when it arrived in a US city and move it on forward. In Georgia, FBI Special Agent Tim Cox and Customs Agent Larry Sapp are working leads of their own. They've been watching a man Hello, Ronnie. named Ronnie Pemberton. They believe he's the latest drug dealer to head the Augusta branch of the Island Boys. Three months after the Tortola shootout, FBI Special Agent Tim Cox decides to send a message to Pemberton at the Atlanta airport. I had heard through our street sources that Pemberton had called me a punk and said we were never going to catch him. And so I thought I would at least introduce myself. So I went to the airport when he came back in and went up and introduced myself and said, hi, Ronnie, welcome back to the country. I'll, I'll be around. Come see me if you'd ever like to talk. But as agents know, island boys never talk. Months pass. In the Virgin Islands in early 1997, the two agents get the break they've been waiting for. A member of the Island Boys sells cocaine out of a hotel room in St. Thomas. A fellow gang member and a buyer sent to kill the dealer pay him a surprise visit. The Island Boy tries to warn his friend by using a special knock signaling danger. The dealer gets the message. He escapes out a back window. The island is a small place to try and hide. Gang members are everywhere. The terrified dealer secretly turns himself in to authorities. In exchange for protection, he agrees to tell the FBI what he knows about the island boys and their dealings in Georgia. Both Larry Sapp and I were very excited because we knew that if we actually had someone that could identify more of these people and, and put us in touch with the routes they use, the methods they're using to, to transport this stuff, it could be a, a huge break in the case. Former U.S. Customs agent Larry Sapp. He was the first one to give us all the, the ins and outs, who was the uh, leaders, how they smuggled, how they distributed, who were distributors, and things of this nature. It's a real big break in the case. Agents are finally starting to get inside this dangerous gang. They begin trying to make their case against the suspected leader, James Springett. We would search customs travel records. We would find out when he had gone in and out of different countries. Uh, we would find out when he would show up on either uh, wire intercepts or show up in conversation with someone else. By doing that and by tracking the shipments, you can put Jimmy in the same area. This all goes to circumstantial evidence and ties Jimmy with it. Springett is careful to keep his hands clean. He does his dirty work through intermediaries and rarely comes in contact with the coke. At the same time, on the island of St. Croix, the DEA convinces a federal judge to allow them to wiretap the prominent family suspected of drug smuggling and of having ties to Springett. We applied for the first ever Title III in Virgin Islands history. DEA agents secretly install the wiretap in a switching station and hide the equipment. We had already received information that they had individuals that worked within the phone company that were checking their phones regularly to see if they were tapped. And so we had to hide that equipment within the phone company's uh, regular wiring. For one month during the summer of 1997, 
investigators listen to the wiretap and conduct simultaneous surveillance. They hear frequent references to Springett's girlfriend, but nothing concrete. The island boys are careful about what they say on the phone. You could tell the conversation was starting to get good. And the next thing that we would hear is, let me call you back. And then surveillance, watch him hang up the phone, jump in his car, and drive down to a payphone, and then finish the call at the payphone. Almost from the onset, they knew we were on that phone. Certainly when you go up on a wire, you don't, you expect when the wire goes down, there's gonna be a roundup very shortly thereafter. We weren't there with this, this wire. The wiretap does provide enough evidence to justify search warrants. On August 7th, agents launched simultaneous raids on 22 island homes and businesses. They have enough to go after several members of the Island Boys gang, but they need a lot more to take down James Springett and dismantle his entire drug trafficking organization. In the Virgin Islands, the DEA and police raid 22 locations. They need enough evidence to put suspected drug lord James Springett out of business forever. His girlfriend's house is a prime target. In her bedroom, agents find a half a million dollars in cash and a business card for an attorney in Panama. They also find Springett's US passport. The passport is stamped with the dates the drug lord visited other Caribbean islands, as well as Colombia, Venezuela, and Europe. By comparing those dates to intelligence on large drug shipments, agents can show whether Springett was in the same country when the drugs arrived. Virgin Islands police detective Chris Howell flies up to Augusta, Georgia to meet with FBI Special Agent Tim Cox and Customs Agent Larry Sapp. We hooked up with Chris Howell, and it was another one of those breaks in the case. Chris had a wealth of information down there about activities in St. Thomas. We had a wealth of information about activities going on in the States. And when we compared the two, we found out that his departures were our arrivals. We cross-matched some of the trips, who was going, who was coming. Uh, it was great information that, that we were able to collaborate on. Authorities finally have enough circumstantial evidence to nail James Springett. Independently, we could have probably put together a case in the islands. And likewise, they probably had the ability to do that there in Georgia. But you combine the two cases together, it, it seems like it's an unstoppable force. Chris Howell wants all the cases tried in Georgia. It will be too difficult to convict Springett in the Virgin Islands. He had evolved into a monster by this point. I mean, he was very well established in South America. He had his own routes here. He had his own assets available to him. So anything you can throw into that on your end is, is beneficial. It would help their case if they could find a more specific link between Springett and the cocaine shipments. Agents review the evidence one more time. When we had done the search warrant at Springett's St. Croix girlfriend's house, we had found business cards for a Panamanian attorney, and we also found business cards in the name of Omega Sea Cargo. According to customs records, a freighter owned by Omega Sea Cargo was stopped a few months after the Tortola shootout. The ship was searched. Eight tons of Colombian cocaine was found in the cargo. Working on a hunch, agents research Omega Sea Cargo. The company is owned by James Springett. It was huge. It was a huge chunk of the case right there. I mean, now we had 6,000 kilograms on Mr. Springett. That was a good feeling. Federal authorities develop a plan to dismantle the Island Boys, starting in Augusta, Georgia. December 15, 1997. Ronnie Pemberton, the local head of the Augusta gang, attempts to buy two kilos of cocaine from a Virgin Island supplier. The FBI is watching. In the motel room next door, customs agent Larry Sapp and FBI special agents Tim Cox and Mike Varacalli videotaped the buy via hidden camera. Our ultimate goal was to tie the organization all the way back to a Colombian connection, find out where the drugs were being 
processed and at what point they were being handed over to Springett and his organization so we could get to the highest level we possibly could. Ronnie Pemberton came in, met an informant. We got it all on video with him holding up the keys and hand balancing, waiting to see which one weighed a little more than the other. Pemberton takes his time examining the bags of cocaine. Finally, he picked two he wanted. Special Agent Tim Cox personally arrests Pemberton. I said, hello, Ronnie, remember me from the airport? And, and he nodded, and I said, well, who's the punk now? Shortly after Pemberton's arrest, FBI Special Agent Tim Cox is promoted and transferred. It's a bittersweet pill because I was with this case since its inception. I knew we were headed towards taking Jimmy Springett off but also knew I would not be there for the finish. Cox leaves Special Agent Mike Varicali in charge of the Island Boys' investigation. Over the next few months, Varicali and his team continue methodically building a case against Springett and the Island Boys. The more we looked into it, the more we uncovered. Uh, 10,000 kilograms turned into 20,000, which turned into 50,000. Less than a year after Pemberton's arrest, an Augusta grand jury delivers indictments against Springett, his girlfriend, and five of his closest associates. We had a sealed indictment for quite a long time, and we're just building a case. We were building a story. Uh, we were basically building our case for court. Uh, we identified individuals, we identified assets. Investigators want to arrest all suspects simultaneously so that none of them can run. But there's a snag. Springett has gone into hiding. It was a frustrating time period because here we are ready for this party and we can't find our main guy. Springett is smart and careful. He did not use the phone unnecessarily. He did not spend a lot of time in one location. And he tended to reside in areas where the US government didn't have complete access and total reach. For two long months, authorities can't find him. Then, in Medellin, Colombia, the case takes a dramatic turn. Please have a seat. A local woman approaches DEA agents. How can we help you? She tells them she knows a big American drug dealer. His name is James Springett. In Medellin, Colombia, DEA agents get a big break in the search for drug trafficker James Springett. An informant claims she knows where Springett lives. She basically walked into the DEA office there and agreed to cooperate with law enforcement. How can I help you? Detective Chris Howell. She indicated he had a penthouse apartment in Medellin. We knew the apartment existed, we just didn't know where it was. The apartment had like muralled ceilings, you know, solid gold faucets, a very expensive uh, apartment. The woman agrees to give the DEA the location of Springett's apartment. In exchange, she wants a fresh start for her family in the witness protection program. Authorities agree to the deal. Special Agent Mike Varichelli. Springett was pretty well insulated in Medellin, Colombia seems to be a haven for high-ranking drug organization members. Uh, so it's traditionally difficult to locate and apprehend an individual for drugs in Medellin. The DEA requests an arrest warrant from the FBI and U.S. Customs in Augusta, Georgia. Former U.S. Customs agent Larry Sapp. The agent there called me and asked me, do we actually, in fact, have a warrant for a James Spring yet? Of course, I enthusiastically told him yes. He asked for me to fax down the fingerprints, the pictures, and uh, all the stuff he would need to get him picked up. The DEA also contacts trusted members of the Colombian police. 
Two Colombian police officers stake out Springett's luxury apartment, waiting for him to appear. To the Colombians, it looks like Springett is leaving for good. They have to move fast. They felt like their surveillance was burned, and they better go ahead and arrest him, and that's what they did. The officers don't have time to wait for backup. They move in. Those two uh, stopped the vehicle and arrested Springett and his driver by themselves, which we thought was mighty courageous. <laughs> Special Agent Tim Cox. When I first heard that they had him in custody down in Columbia, I was elated. This was the culmination of 14-year investigation, which started from the lowest level street dealers all the way up to the made man with the Colombian Mafia who had the direct Colombian connection supplying cocaine. Agents from the FBI, Customs, and the DEA converge on the Virgin Islands to arrest Springett's associates. Local drug dealers quickly retreat into their fortified mansions. We probably got dope dealers flushing their dope everywhere on St. Croix. One mansion on St. Thomas is so remote and well protected that Virgin Island police have to rappel down the cliff above it and approach it from the rear. They had walls up around the house, um, electric gates. There was, there was a real security issue on how we could do these things successfully. House by house, the task force arrests the leadership of the island boys. Although they finally have Springett in custody, Getting him back to the U.S. proves to be far more difficult than anyone had ever imagined. He's in custody in Colombia, yeah, and that's the big problem because extradition out of Colombia is a difficult task, and what made it more difficult is he had citizenship at that point in Colombia. Investigators will now have to go through a long bureaucratic process to try to extradite him back to the U.S. It's like beating a dead horse. I mean, there's nothing you can really do to speed the process. You put in the request, and it goes through the channels, and then you just wait. I knew that the longer Jimmy was down there, the longer we didn't have him on American soil in our custody, the greater the chance that, that he would either escape or someone would break him out. While in prison, Springett pays to have luxuries brought in to pass the time in comfort. They have well, people that wait on kind of like orderlies to go to give them stuff, and if they can't leave the penitentiary, they'll go outside the penitentiary and get it and bring it back to them. On March 1st, 2000, a few days before his extradition becomes final, Springett orders a new mattress. When the new mattress was delivered to his cell, he was able to insert himself in the new mattress. It was just wide enough to fit his body, and the individual that brought the mattress to him aided him in, in sewing the mattress back up. So there was no hole, there was no evidence that someone had been inserted into the mattress. One of the most dangerous drug dealers in the world is carried out of his cell past unsuspecting guards. American drug trafficker James Springett attempts a daring escape from a prison in Columbia sealed inside a mattress. FBI Special Agent Tim Cox. Jimmy got into the mattress. They stitched him back up in there and proceeded to carry him through, I think, about five checkpoints, getting him out of the prison. An investigation later shows that Springett paid more than $3 million in bribes to set up his incredible escape. Investigators take the news hard. James Springett has escaped. He's gone, I'd put uh, 10 years of my investigative career into eventually getting this guy, and now he was gone. I was, I was completely deflated. We had a hard enough time catching him the first time. Uh, it was my fear that because he'd been caught one time, that we'd never be able to get him again. Detective Chris Howell. We're back at ground zero trying to figure out where do we go from here? At that point, we have no idea to even, you know, where to look. We have no leads. We have no idea. He could have been anywhere in the world. Exactly. Agents notify FBI legal attaches at U.S. embassies throughout Latin America. 
They also notify customs and DEA agents working in those countries. FBI Special Agent Mike Varacalli. We basically contacted Interpol. We contacted all the countries we know he has ties to and got the word out as far as where he last was, what he looks like. There was rumors starting to spread that he had had reconstructive surgery, you know, changed his appearance and everything, and it just kind of became like this urban legend, you know, this, this guy who was out there, but no one knew how to, how to find him. According to rumors, Springett is living somewhere in Latin America and running his organization by phone. Jimmy, just like anybody else, has to have an income. When you're spending $5 million on an escape and you're living the lifestyle that he's accustomed to doing, you have to have an income. So he had uh, started generating that income again. In April 2002, the FBI adds Springett to their list of top 10 fugitives. And to put him on the FBI top most wanted list during this time frame was major because, I mean, he was sharing, sharing poster space with guys like Osama bin Laden at that point. Investigators also play a few long shots. They set up surveillance on a drug dealer known to be part of Springett's group. Agents wait until they have probable cause and then search him. They find a large amount of cocaine and take him into custody. Help us find your uncle. You'll do a lot less time. Investigators pressure the dealer. What city is he in? I don't know. What country is he in? He decides to talk. He tells them Springett now lives in Venezuela. He doesn't know which city. He only knows the phone number. The FBI legal attache in Venezuela gives the phone number to an elite team of trusted local police officers. Using the phone number and informants, the Venezuelan police locate Springett's home and stake it out. Springett offered two to three million dollars to let, just let him walk away from the scene. There are many honest law enforcement officials that there's no amount of money that would entice them to do that. Thankfully, we had some down in Venezuela. Okay. FBI, DEA, and customs agents work to get Springett back to the U.S. as soon as possible. Venezuelan authorities are declaring persona non grata because he's in the country on a false passport and ordered to be uh, removed from the country immediately. Less than 24 hours after the arrest, Venezuelan police hand Springett over to FBI and customs agents at the airport. Agents fly him back to the United States. He knew that he wouldn't stand a chance going to trial in Augusta, Georgia, with all the evidence that had been you know, mounted against him. I think he knew the only thing he had available to him and his only chance of, of ever having, you know, the chance to see the light of day again would be to accept the sub to plea agreement. Springett pleads guilty to one count of conspiracy to import cocaine. The notorious drug lord is sentenced to 35 years without parole. Hard to beat the significance of this investigation. When you talk about a street-level case being worked all the way up to a 10 most wanted and, a, and an ultimate capture, it's kind of hard to beat that. It's, it's definitely a highlight of my career. <laughs>